Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Thank you for taking time to uh, join with me to learn and grow together as we study God's Word together. We're going to continue our study of the life of Moses tonight. We're going to be looking in Exodus, the third chapter, beginning at verse 7. We're actually going to finish that chapter out and go into the fourth chapter to in and around verse 18. Tonight, what we're going to be discussing is resisting God's call. So if you have your Bible, please go ahead and be turning to Exodus, the third chapter. And while you're finding your way there, let me again welcome you, those who are tuning in now. Uh, we want to encourage you to participate in this service tonight. You feel free, if you're watching this on Facebook, to hit those emoji buttons. Uh, you are welcome to make comments. Uh, we love it when you interact. Uh, also, if you find something in this that is a blessing to you and you think would be a blessing to others, we would be honored if you would share it with those people. So thank you again uh, for being a part of this tonight. And let's, as we get started tonight, I want to ask us a question. <clears throat> Have you ever tied your shoes up in a knot? Uh, how about maybe a necklace or a hoodie or just anything that you've got to tie. Uh, getting something tied up in a knot is really pretty easy, isn't it? But untying one takes patience and gentleness. Um, I can remember my daughter getting uh, knots in her necklaces and she would bring them to me to, to try to get them out. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure I could do it now. Uh, at least not without my glasses and maybe a magnifying glass. But anyway, it takes a lot of patience to untie knots. It takes very little effort and very little time to get in a knot. Well, that's the way it is in life sometimes. Sometimes life gets tied up in knots, especially when we live outside of God's plan for us. Now, Moses is learning that lesson the hard way. God had a plan for Moses' life, and Satan worked overtime to snuff out that plan. Now, Moses was born at a time when all of the Hebrew baby boys were to be thrown into the Nile River. And only God knows exactly how many infants lost their lives during this evil plan. But we know of one who was spared. Moses' parents put him in a basket and placed him in the reeds not far from the river shore. Pharaoh's daughter found the basket, and Moses found favor. God was preserving Moses for his plan. When Moses grew up as a prince of Egypt. He received the best education and training that the culture could offer. But somewhere along the way, there's also good reason to believe that Moses began to sense God's calling on his life to deliver the Hebrews from their bondage. And one day he decided to expedite that plan. He witnessed an Egyptian taskmaster um, abusing one of his countrymen. And he intervened in that situation by murdering that taskmaster. Uh, that intervention resulted in um, him having to bury that man in a shallow grave. And when the deed was discovered, Pharaoh put a bounty on Moses' head. And Moses had to run for his life. Moses' life was in a knot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moses ended up in Midian by a well, and he helped some shepherdesses water their sheep, which got him an invitation to dinner, where he got better acquainted with a family that he would eventually marry into and work for. And one day, while working in the field tending sheep, Moses began learning that God knows how to untie knots. Um, there's a little uh, poem, if you will, that I read that Chuck Swindoll shared in his book about the life of Moses, and it goes this way. With thoughtlessness and impatient hands, we tangle up the plans the Lord has wrought. And when we cry in pain, he says, be quiet, my child, while I untie the knot. I am glad that among the many various things that God specializes in, one of the things he specializes in is untying the, the knots that we tie up in our lives. Now, um, in Exodus, the third chapter, the first six verses, we have the account of how God appeared to Moses in a burning bush 
that was not consumed by the flames. After Moses has spent 40 years, uh, pushing 40 years out in the wilderness, he spent the first 40 years of his life um, in a palace in Egypt. And now he's in the next 40 years of his life where he's out in the wilderness, living in obscurity, uh, just happy to be alive, happy to be married, happy to have children, happy to be working. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and God appears to him. And, and that burning bush account that we studied about in the last lesson was a, a, a divine encounter that God had ordained that he wanted Moses to have. And in that encounter, God informed Moses that the deal was still on, that the call that God had on Moses' life was still intact. Let's read in Exodus, the third chapter, beginning of verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and a large land and a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Look at what's going on here. Even though Moses got out of God's will, the call was still there. Even though Moses blew it, God still wanted his people delivered and he still wanted to work through Moses to make that happen. My friends, that is a beautiful picture of the grace of God. Um, even though, again, even though Moses got out of God's will, the call was still there. Romans 11, the 29th verse says this, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, we may not get to express them in the same way, but the call of God, whatever the call is that God has on our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, it never goes away. We can frustrate that plan. We can run away from that plan. Um, in some cases, we may even... Uh, disqualify ourselves from certain aspects of fulfilling that plan but the call never goes away uh, God had a call on Moses' life and Moses thought that everything that had happened meant that he wasn't going to get to fulfill that call God is now showing up and saying hey buddy I'm still going to use you this again is a beautiful picture of grace <clears throat> we need to understand, too, this thing called the call of God was not a suggestion. Chuck Swindoll notes these words when he talks about the call of God. Notice, please, <clears throat> excuse me, this was not a multiple choice arrangement. It wasn't even an invitation. It was a call. God does not speak and ask our advice regarding his plan. God makes declarations. He doesn't open up the scene for a rap session or a dialogue. He doesn't call in a blue ribbon panel of consultants to suggest viable options. He speaks, and that is that. I say amen to that, my friends. Chuck Swindoll hit the nail right on the head. This was the call of God on Moses' life, and it was not up for debate or discussion. This is what God had for Moses and Moses alone to do. Now, I believe God has a call on all of our lives, and we're to seek that call out and, and then to fulfill it. Now, there are some things that are a general call that we all are to participate in. We're all called, first and foremost, to come to salvation and to be sanctified, but then there are specific callings that God places on individuals and things that he has for us to do, and we need to walk in obedience to that. Uh, the most important thing in any venture that you are considering undertaking is for the Lord. If, if God has a call on your life, and I believe he does, whatever that call may be, I can't 
tell you what the specific call of God on your life is other than to know him and to serve him. But how you're to express all of your service to him is for you to discern. But the most important thing for you to do is to find that and then to fulfill it. Now, the Bible's full of people who are called of God to do various things. Um, Jonah, <clears throat> excuse me, was prejudiced against the Ninevites, but God called him anyway. And he ended up going and doing what he was supposed to do, and that's a good thing. Gideon wrestled with fear, but God chose him to lead a small army against the Midianites and the Amalekites. God wouldn't let his fear disqualify him from being in service to the Lord. David was the youngest and the smallest of Jesse's sons, but that didn't matter. He was still called to the Lord to be the king, uh, to take King Saul's place, the king of Israel. Second uh, Chronicles 16, verse 9, the first part of that verse says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Uh, God is looking throughout the whole earth according to these uh, the words of this verse. And when he finds someone who has a heart for him, he's going to do a great thing through that person or through those people. When we get our heart right with God, we are preparing ourselves and positioning ourselves to be used of him. And when that call comes, whatever it may be, <clears throat> we need to heed that call. So God had this call for Moses to go and be the deliverer of his people. He's going to go back to Egypt and he's going to stand before Pharaoh and he's going to say, let my people go, speaking on behalf of God. Well, Moses resisted this call. He made up excuses on why he shouldn't follow God's plan and God's call. And the, the first one is found in Exodus, the third chapter, beginning at verse 11. We want to pick it up there. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this will be a sign to you that I've sent to you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve the Lord God on this mountain. All right. Look at what um, Moses is saying. He hears very clearly after seeing a bush that is on fire that's not being consumed. He goes over and he hears God speak to him. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And by the way, I got some work for you to do. You know, what I called you to do a long time ago that you went about the wrong way doing. I want you to do it now. And Moses' response is, who am I that you would choose me to do this? In other words, his first excuse is, I'm not good enough or I'm not enough. I'm not worthy to do this work. My friends, that's a common excuse. Um, I remember when I began sensing the call into pastoral ministry. Um, I thought, there's no way I can do this. I, I'm not capable of doing it. I'm not, I'm not good enough to do it. I'm not worthy of doing it. And any of my pastor friends that I've ever talked to, They've always, every one of them have told me that for a time they resisted that call. And one of the first things that came to heart and mind is, who, who am I that God would call me to do this? That's what Moses is saying here. And while that's a valid question, the reality of it is God never called anybody because they're such good people. Um. According to the scripture, none of us are good apart from him. He's the one that makes us good. And once he makes us good, he's the one that gifts us uh, for the things that he wants us to do. And when he gives us to do whatever it is he wants us to do, and he gives us the call to fulfill it, he gives us the same promise that he gave to Moses. God had a response to Moses' question who, uh, who am I that I should do this? And his response simply was, I'm going to be with you. I'm enough to strengthen you and to guide you. And because I've said do this, I'm not going to send you out there on your own. I will be with you. 
My friends, he tells us the same thing, and he's good to that promise. I can assure you, um, while I wrestled with the call to do what I'm doing now, I have found, once I stepped out on faith and accepted that, and I've been doing this for 30 years now, actually preaching longer than that, I have found God has been with me every step of the way, and I'm grateful for that. He offered, Moses offered the, the excuse, who am I? And God responded, I've called you, I'm going to be with you. Then Moses offers this excuse, this question, well, who are you? <laughs> Pick it up in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they say to me, what is his name and what shall I say to them? <clears throat> Pardon me. What Moses is saying here after he hears God say, listen, when I send you and you stand before your countrymen and you stand before Pharaoh, you're going to tell him I'm the one that sent you. Well, now Moses is saying, all right, well, then who are you? <laughs> In other words, are you sure, you know, are, are, are you enough to make this happen? Boy, that, that's getting in dangerous territory, okay? Um, I, I'm thankful that Moses was honest. But he was really doubting and needing reassurance that God was enough to do this. And listen to God's response. It's going to cover several verses, so please bear with me. Because his response is, you know what? I am the great I am. Pick it up in verse 14 of Exodus 3. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am as sent you. Send me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then they will heed your voice, and you shall come and to the elders of Israel and to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with me. And now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Look at what God is telling Moses here. He, he says, first of all, in direct um, answer to his question, who am I? Well, I am the great I am. I am who I am. I'm the God of your fathers, and I'm enough. My friends, God is enough. He is the great I am. He is the most powerful one. He is the creator of this universe. There's no higher authority than God. Now think about that. Um, Moses was scared to death to go back to Egypt. He was a wanted man there. Even though the Pharaoh who had put the bounty on his head had since died, there were other people who remembered what Moses had done. So Pharaoh was in charge in Egypt. And that was an issue that weighed heavy on Moses' heart and mind. But God is reminding Moses that his authority supersedes any earthly authority. We need to remember that. <clears throat> when we are on God's side, we have the greatest authority on our side. Um, there is no greater. Now, we're to respect God-ordained earthly authority. We're to honor that. 
we're to abide by it as long as it does not, it does not conflict with the law of God. <coughs> Pardon me. But God is still greater than all. Um, this, we're not supposed to take this information and live this way and become arrogant and live in this world and think that we're better than anybody and everybody or anything like that. But we're to remember while we're honoring the Lord and respecting the authorities that are placed over us, uh, where we live and in uh, the nation that we get to be a part of, there's a greater than the mayor of your city. There's a greater than the governor of the state. There's a greater than the president of the United States. I mean, no disrespect to any of the people holding those positions, but they're not the highest authority. God is. And God wanted Moses and he wants us to remember that. Moses' first excuse was, I'm not good enough. Who am I? His second question and excuse was, well, Lord, really, who are you? Who am I going to say that, that sent me? And God said, I am sent you. I am that ultimate authority. Well, then there's another excuse that Moses offers, and it comes up in the fourth chapter in verse 1. And he's basically saying, well, what if they don't listen to me? Basically, what Moses was saying is, I'm not confident enough. I don't think they'll hear me. Exodus 4, 1 says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Well, God's response to this in Exodus 4, verses 2 through 9, is let me show you what you can do with my help. Um, now, here's the interesting thing. God now asks Moses a question. He says, what's that you're holding in your hand? And he says, well, it's, it's a rod. And that was his rod or his staff that he used as a shepherd. That, that rod for a shepherd was his livelihood. It was with that rod that he corrected the sheep. It was with that rod that he protected the sheep. That rod was his comfort. It was his security. That rod was vital to what Moses had been doing for 40 years. Moses had maybe that very rod for that entire 40-year period of time. He was comfortable with it. It was familiar to him. It was with that rod that he had earned his living and provided for his family. And God looks at him and he says, hey, I want you to throw down that rod. I want you to let go of this thing that is your security and your, your strength and your provision. I want you to give it to me. And here's the interesting thing. When he threw that down, that rod turned into a snake. I got to tell you, I'm not big on snakes, folks. I mowed my yard yesterday. That's why I'm <clears throat> still coughing some. All my allergies are flared up. Um, but while mowing my yard yesterday, I saw two snakes. There might have been more than two out there, but I only saw two. And the good news is I was on a riding mower, and they saw me first, and they took off because they were scared of, not of me, but of the mower, all right? Uh, I just don't care for snakes. And here is Moses taking his rod, throwing it down, and it becomes a snake miraculously. Then God says something else to him. <laughs> Pick up that snake. Now, I got to tell you, it was one thing for Moses to, by faith, obey the Lord and, and just throw that rod down. But it was going to take a whole lot more faith for him to do this next thing. He said, pick it up. And God, or, or, and Moses reached down and he picked up that snake and it became a rod again. Now, here's what was the significance of this. The miracle is not so much in that it turned to a snake and back into a rod. But when Moses let go of that rod, that thing which he held dear, which was so important to him and to his livelihood, he was letting go of, of that particular item and he was turning it over to the Lord. Before he let go of it, it was the rod of Moses. But when he relinquished it to the Lord, it became the rod of God. And God began showing him right there exactly what 
God can do with something if we're willing to let go of it. That rod ended up eventually being what Moses would hold up when the Red Sea was parted and when all these other miracles took place. And we'll read more about that. And I don't want to get too far ahead in the story. But the, the basic point is this. Um, God is showing Moses what he can do with something that we'll let go of. In other words, if they're not going to listen to you, Moses, don't worry. If they're going to wonder, did I really send you? I'm going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're my boy, you're my man for this job. And one of the ways he did that was through uh, the rod turning into a snake. Now, if you read in uh, the rest of Exodus 4, verses 2 through 9, you find out he also told Moses to put his hand into uh, his cloak or his coat and pull it back out. It became leprous. He put it back in, pulled it out, and it, it became whole again. Um, and then a third thing, he said, you're going to take some water and pour it on the ground. And when you pour that water on the ground, it became blood. He gave him three distinct miraculous things that he was able to do when Moses was willing to be used of the Lord. But the point was this. His response to the question is, Moses, let me show you what I can do with someone who simply follows me and does what I say. We need to remember that when God calls us to do whatever it is he calls us to do, he's asking us to trust him and then turn over what it is that is precious to us. Um, we all, metaphorically speaking, have a shepherd's staff, if you will, or the equivalent thereof. And God's going to look us, at us at some point and say, hey, will you turn that over to me? Uh, there's a New Testament story that I believe coincides with this well. It's that story of the, the young lad who had the five loaves and um, you know, just a couple of fish. And Jesus had a big group of people that he needed to feed. And that little boy had the opportunity to relinquish his lunch into the hands of God, in the hands of Jesus in this point. And he did so. Now, before, uh, what that boy had basically in his lunchbox was, you know, five loaves of bread and two fish. All that would do would be feeding him. But when he turned it over to, to the Lord, the Lord fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children with that. The, the point is this. When we take what we have and turn it over to the Lord, the Lord always does more with it. Take heart with that, my friends. That's what God was telling Moses, and that's what he's telling us as well. Well, there are uh, a couple of other excuses that Moses offers. In uh, Exodus 4.10, he's we read this, Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. In other words, he's, say, he's saying, what if they don't understand me? I'm not gifted enough. God's response, <clears throat> excuse me, is simply trust me. In verses 11 and 12, he says, So the Lord said to him, Who's made God's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Every pastor, every Bible teacher, has I can identify with this. I can identify with it. I can remember thinking, I'm supposed to be a preacher? What am I going to stand up there and say for 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes? Well, God tells us what to say. We're to study, we're to prepare, we're to learn and to grow. But God gifts us to do that certain thing. And I'm sure some of you probably wish that he would gift me to maybe like go more 20 minutes now instead of 50 minutes. But hey, that's how it happens sometimes. What The, the, the answer to that um, excuse is, Moses, you're going to have to trust me. Then there's one other. Um, in verse 13 of Exodus 4, we read these words. But he said, O oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. In other words, he's saying, is there not somebody else that you could get to do this? <laughs> um, he, he didn't feel qualified. And, and I get that. None of us feel qualified. 
And God, for, for reasons only known to God, he responds to Moses, all right, you know what? Aaron can go with you. But quite honestly, you're going to end up regretting this. <laughs> um, verses uh, 14 through 17 of Exodus 4. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you will speak to him, and you will put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you will do the signs. Basically, what God is saying here is, all right, uh, you don't have to do this by yourself. And by the way, that's a good thing. God has been very consistent now through the years in being sure that not only is he with us, but he also puts good people around us to do um, great things with us and to help support us. And in this case, um, Aaron ended up being that person. Now, after all of these five excuses were given, we've got every reason to believe that Moses finally said, all right, I, I'm going to do this. I want to trust you, and I'm going to go forward. And when you read on through, you find that to be the case as you read on into Exodus. So as we close out tonight, I want to suggest a couple of things that we need to keep in mind when it comes to the call of God. And even if we've knotted up the call of God in our lives, or we've knotted up our lives, and God still has a call on us and wants to use us, remember these three things. One, you can run from God's call, but you can't hide. Whatever calling God has on your life, you can run all you want to from it, but you can't hide from it. You can't get away from it. And if God's truly calling you to it, this is what I tell people who come to me and they wonder if they're called into ministry or whatever it is they may be called to, but particularly in the ministry. I, I just remind them, I, I, I say, hey, you know, if this is really God, you're going to know beyond a shadow of any doubt. And it, one of the ways you're going to know is if you can be truly at peace and content doing anything else, go do it. But if God's call is on your life to do a certain thing, you're not really going to be content or at peace until you do it. Uh, you can run, but you can't hide. Next, you can argue with God, but you won't win. The worst thing you could do, one of the worst things that you can do, is think you're smarter than God. Go ahead and try to argue with him. I'm, I'm guilty of that, you know, I, had my, I have I have had my times and will probably have some more where I think I've got a pretty good case on why things ought to go a certain way or why I shouldn't do a certain thing or should do a certain thing. You can argue with God all you want to, but you're not going to win. Um, he's the highest authority. He's the great I am. The last thing that I want to close with is this. You can follow God and do amazing things. Moses never thought in a million years that he would do all the things that he's about to do as we read on in the scripture. I mean, he kind of thought there's that we got scriptural evidence. He thought he could deliver his people by killing one Egyptian at a time. Not a good plan. Well, now that he's going to follow God and get in on God's plan and doing it God's way, we're going to see God do some amazing things through this man named Moses and I've got news for us tonight um, Moses is not the only one God wants to work through now Moses was the one to uh, lead the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery we don't have to go do that but there's something God has for us to do and we can make excuses we can argue we can run from it but my friends please let's learn from Moses don't do that let's just trust God and allow him to do in and through us what only he can do. When we follow God, we can do amazing things. I hope you've received a blessing from this tonight. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I look forward to continuing this study with you again next week. God bless and have a great night.